Welcome. My name is Sarah Coffey. I'm one of the structural interventional cardiology NPs here at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. We want to welcome you to this webinar series. Tonight, we're going to focus on the indications for surgical aortic valve replacement versus transcatheter aortic valve replacement. Um, it gives me great honor tonight to introduce my esteemed interventional cardiology colleague, Dr. Mohamed Al-Khouli, who is both professor of medicine here at the School of Mayo and the chair of research and innovation committee for the interventional cardiology here at Mayo Clinic. Dr. Al-Khouli is a skilled interventional cardiologist, avid researcher, and mentor to all those he comes in contact with. Um, we're going to make our way through eight or nine different complex clinical scenarios this evening, and we want this to be an interactive format. So after every clinical scenario, we'll pull the audience and see what you would do if this was your patient, and then we'll wrap up and discuss. Also, at the bottom of your screen is a Q&A section. You can place any questions that you have, and at the end, we'll do a formal question and answer session. Um, I think before we begin, though, we need to acknowledge the complexity of these patients and the multidisciplinary team that it takes to make these decisions, which includes our CV surgeon colleagues as well. Um, we have no disclosures this evening. And then uh, our objectives are to describe the changing and challenging landscapes of aortic valve interventions and then to identify current indications for both surgical and transcatheter aortic valve replacements. Um, first of all, we're gonna talk about the landscape of aortic valve replacements in the United States. So on the left-hand side of this graph, um, number one, we see in 2016, the annual TAVR volume exceeded isolated surgical aortic valve replacements. This graph then continues to show that TAVR volumes have increased every year, exceeding the surgical aortic valve replacements in 2019. The graph on the right shows us the continued decrease in mortality at both 30 days and one year for uh, transcatheter aortic valve replacement patients. Um, we know, though, there are still a good portion of patients that will still undergo surgical aortic valve replacement. So our goal in this webinar is to identify, help identify those patients that would benefit from surgery. Perfect. Well, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this exciting webinar. And uh, thank you, Sarah, for the kind introduction and the uh, laying the background for this uh, webinar. Um, what we're trying to do is we, we would like to make it as practical as possible. We don't want to, I mean, this is a scary slide, I understand, but we're not really going to focus on that. We're just going to do a slide or two about the guidelines and then show some clinical scenarios that will make them, that will make it hopefully useful to you in your clinical practice. And the recurrent theme that I want you to remember from this webinar is if you're, if you're in the clinic, you're considering patient for TAVR versus SAVR, there are five fundamental questions that we ask for all of our patients uh, with the help of our surgical colleagues, right? So we'll go over those in a little bit. And the reason why I'm trying to simplify, we're trying to simplify it here is just take a snapshot uh, of this guideline here. And you will see that most of the, most of the decision tree that you see in front of you actually talks about age and surgical risk, right? But we know that it's much more complex than that. There are a lot of factors that play into this, right? Uh, frailty, concomitant disease, other problems, a lot of things that we would hope to cover in this webinar. So uh, to help you really go further beyond, beyond this, this chart in a more practical manner uh, and make it applicable to your patients. So the, the, those things that we're gonna talk about in the next few cases, are the valve and vascular anatomy and other factors that will make patients suitable for TAVI versus not, right? So that's all what you see in this slide. Most of the work, most, most of the talk is about age and surgical risk, but then they have in the guidelines, a very nice table of those additional factors that are important to consider, but without really much in-depth um, discussion about how to consider these factors, right? So just keep this slide in mind. We're not going to go over it in details now, but we're going to show you a few scenarios where the valve anatomy, the uh, concurrent cardiac and non-cardiac condition, 
did matter a lot in making the decision. And hopefully we'll, since we're gonna make it interactive, we'll present a case, we'll show you, a we'll ask you what would you do next? And then we'll discuss between me and Sarah what we have done in this patient. So let's jump right into the first case. So this is a, uh, and, and it's not an extensive, uh, you know, background of each case. It's going to be one single slide per case. So this first case is a 72-year-old female with class three dyspnea and severe aortic stenosis. And the five fundamental questions that I ask myself every time in the clinic, does the patient have concurrent cardiac conditions, major non-concurrent cardiac conditions, uh, concurrent non-cardiac conditions? What's the surgical risk? Is the valve anatomy suitable for TAVI? Um, is the transfemoral access possible or not, right? So in this patient, I ask the same questions and I'm just putting the pertinent positives on the slides. So the patient did have severe coronary artery disease. As you see in this slide, there is severe, uh, it's a very short left main. So it's uh, left main disease and osteal LAD uh, circumflex uh, stenosis. The patient that does have a cardiomyopathy, the ejection fraction was 35%. The patients didn't have a lot of major non-cardiac conditions. So kidneys, liver, lungs, the major, the major organs are functioning relatively okay. Uh, yet the patient did have a high intermediate risk for uh, AVR and coronary artery bypass. Uh, so the, then the next, the next question is related to the valve anatomy, which we could talk about in depth in subsequent cases, but mostly is the, is the valve size suitable? Sometimes we have patients where the valve size is too small or more often too large for the commercially available valves. So that increases the risk of embolization, for example. Another thing would be the coronary height. As we know, when we do TAVR, TAVI or TAVR, um, we, we, we dis, displace the native, the native valve into the annulus. So if the coronary arteries are very low in the aorta, the native valve can obstruct the coronary arteries. Uh, so these are a couple of considerations for the valve anatomy to be suitable. We'll talk about some more later on. And then transfemoral axis, is that feasible or not? Because we know that the femoral axis is much lower risk than all of the other alternative axis uh, options. So, so with this information that you have in mind, if you're seeing this patient in clinic today, what would you do? Would you refer this patient for surgical replacement? Would you do TAVR? Would you manage the patient medically because it's difficult to do either one of the first two options or you're uncertain? So please go ahead, you'll see, you'll see the question popping out uh, uh, with the four options. Uh, select the best option for your practice. And then I'll go with a little bit of a discussion with Sarah. And if you have questions beyond that, please feel free to plug that into the chat uh, chat box and we'll, we'll try to go through the questions as well. Okay, right. so we see the results here. Uh, most of you, Sarah, do you wanna go over the results? Yeah, so refer for SABR was 72% and refer for TAVR was 28%. Nobody medical management and no uncertainty in this case. Um, Dr. Alcooley, what did you choose in this patient? Yeah, I, I, I sided with the majority here. So I, I agreed that, that surgical replacement would be a better option. Um, and I think uh, this is the, the key thing I would also would like to emphasize. I mean, we, the heart team is essential and it's great to for collaboration and for giving the patient the best option. But I would hope that we would still select the best for the patient, regardless of you know if 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 that you know the heart team was available at that minute or not. So this patient was sent for TAVR, really wanted TAVR, but we really strongly felt that the coronary disease would be difficult to address with the transcatheter approach. The surgical risk was not prohibitive, and we we you know the the surgeon and I discussed this and we went together to the room, told the patient the options that we that we would prefer uh, SAVR and cabbage over TAVR, um, and the patient agreed with the recommendation. Dr. Alcooley, if the patient had not wanted open surgical replacement, would you have offered complex PCI and TAVR? And then when with TAVR, do you intervene on the coronaries if he was having no angina? All right, so that's a great question. You know, the, the, I think there is, a notion that you have to intervene of all severe lesions, right? 
And um, I don't know if we have data supporting that. Um, I think our preference is if there is severe proximal disease, right, proximal RCA, LAD, or circumflex, uh, or if there is angina, we prefer to address that. The risk of complications during TAVR because of coronary disease is very small, even in, in very severe lesions. Um, this disease, though, was so severe that uh, it would be, it would be um, difficult to neglect and not treat it. So we would have offered patient a complex PCI and TAVR if, if they declined uh, surgical intervention. Perfect. I think we can move on to the next clinical scenario. Perfect. So this is an 85 year old male. And I think Sarah, there, there might be a couple of questions coming to the chat. So maybe if they are relevant to a specific case, we could, we could gather them together and then pause in a little bit and just address them and move on. Um, so this uh, case number two is an 85 year old male with syncope and critical aortic stenosis. The gradient was 60. Uh, the patient, I asked myself the same five questions, right? Is there a concurrent cardiac disease? Uh, yes, there was severe mitral regurgitation, as you could see here on the transesophageal echo imaging. Um, was there any major non-cardiac condition? And the answer was yes. There is CKD stage four. The patient was also frail. Surgical risk uh, was 7.6% for mortality. The patient did have a suitable anatomy for both TAVR and uh, for TAVR through the transfemoral route. So the coronary height was, was appropriate. The valve size was good. There was no excessive calcification in the annulus uh, and the patient did have, a, did have a good transfemoral axis. So now this case takes us to the you know, second complex scenario where what do you do if the patient has multivalvular, multivalve disease, right? So we have severe MR, severe aortic stenosis. And what should we do here? Should we offer the patient uh, TAVR with the hope that we may, the MR might improve later on, or we could address that with mitraclip maybe, or should we bite the bullet and do surgery? Surgical risk is not prohibitive, it's certainly high, but it's not prohibitive. So let's ask the audience, what would you guys do here? So same thing, same options will show up for every case, surgical uh, replacement, uh, transcatheter, medical management or uncertain. Here we have the answers. So Sarah, do you want to tell us what? Yeah, so refer for SAVR was 23%, SAVR plus MBR, or refer for TAVR and maybe uh, possibly staged MitroClip was 73% and 5% uncertain. Um, right. Dr. Akuli, what did you guys choose in this patient? Yeah, so that's, that's a great, you know, it's, it's a great case to, to discern, you know, what would we do? Uh, so the, first, the question that we didn't ask here is if you have multivalvular disease and you're considering transcatheter intervention, you would wanna include in your decision tree, is that valve disease, the residual valve disease amenable to catheter treatment or not, right? Sometimes we have severe aortic stenosis, severe mitral regurgitation, but the mitral valve cannot be treated with mitral clip. So you know that by doing TAVR alone, you would be leaving the patient with severe MR, which does not improve in the majority of patients uh, based on multiple papers. Uh, 60, 65 of patients do, percent do not improve their MR, especially if it is uh, primary or degenerative. So in this case, we did, we did also do what the majority said because the, we thought that the mitral, the mitral valve is addressable with mitral clip. Uh, the surgical risk was high. The kidney disease was concerning. Um, so we offered the patient both options with the preference to TAVR and mitraclip. So the patient did have TAVR, uh, felt better, about 50-60% improvement. The mitral valve did not improve. And we went ahead and did mitraclip successfully, which took away most of the symptoms. Perfect. Do you think the kidney disease plays a major role in that? I mean, making that decision with chronic kidney disease stage four and helping exactly. make that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, for one thing that I would like also that the, the audience to remember is uh, the risk of complication differs between transcatheter and surgical approaches and for each single complication, right? So for TAVR, the anatomy plays a big role, but for surgical intervention, organ function is very, very important. 
So you don't want to do a successful AVR and then end up on dialysis at age 86. So that was a major role, a major concern for the patient and the heart team as well. Fortunately, the anatomy was amenable to address all of it with catheter approaches. So uh, that was uh, fortunately successful in this case. And Dr. Alcooley, we see this a lot with our transcatheter patients or severe aortic stenosis that they've got significant uh, kidney disease. You know, CT is needed for these patients. Is there any way to get around that? Or what do we do here to help mitigate, you know, dialysis on these patients? Yeah, terrific question. So we have started looking into that um, where, you know, the, originally the TAVR was all, the valve size was all done with, with echo. And then data have shown that echo was suboptimal. And if you do it with CT, you get better results. Um, there, is mis, there is a difference in sizing, but that was before 3D echo was available, right? So now we have 3D echo. We use it successfully for the mitral valve. We use it successfully for the left atrial appendage closure. So we restarted doing that for a selected group of patients who have severe valve, aortic valve disease, where we think we would like to do a minimal contrast approach, right? Um, so we do have a we do have an individualized protocol for CT for them, but we can also do uh, 3D TEE if we're confident with the measurement, uh, then we could proceed with that in, in a selected group of patients. And thank you, Sarah, for not asking me about residual tricuspid regurgitation because we, we it's a difficult question, but I'm gonna ask myself that because uh, <laughs> we don't really currently have a transcatheter solution. It's an undertreated valve. And we know that a lot of patients who have very symptomatic TR, if we address the aortic valve is not enough. Uh, so hopefully in the, in the near future, we'll have transcatheter ways of dealing with that. But if not, then we should really have a second look about surgery and addressing the tricuspid valve. It's just a common thing that we see, as you, as you know, in our clinics. Yeah, perfect. I think we can move on to the third clinical scenario. Perfect. All right. So a little different case. So 82-year-old female with class 2 dyspnea, exercise intolerance. She still exercises. She's an active lady and uh, severe aortic stenosis. So surprisingly for her age, she still does not have major concurrent cardiac disc conditions. And again, I'm only putting the pertinent positive. So if there was moderate MR or some mild other disease, we, don't, we wouldn't list it here. We only list the major, major ones. So if, if it was a mild CKD, we would not list it here. We would just list what would make, you know, make a major impact on the decision. Surgical risk was 6%. The valve anatomy was, was high risk for TAVR. So this is the catch here, right? So things looked initially okay for TAVR until we reached the, the point of how we're going to land the valve in, in its spot. So I don't know if it's easy to see on the on the screen, but uh, there is a ton of calcium in the left ventricular outflow tract extending into the mitral valve. There is there is also calcium in the annulus, uh, calcium in the STG junction here, and then you have uh, you have a long, very long leaflet extending into the origin of the coronary artery. So this case was not only high risk for coronary occlusion when we put a surgery when we put a taper valve in it but also for an annular injury. Uh, even though the transfemoral axis was fine, this was not, did not seem to be a great case for TAVR. Now, when we offered the patient the options, the patient really, really pushed for TAVR. So you're seeing this patient today in clinic, this is the data, what would you do? Same options. So we, we got the results. So refer for SAVR was 58%, refer for TAVR 33, 4% medical management and 4% uncertain. So in this case- That's interesting, right? That's interesting. We did 33% uh, voted for TAVR. So let's talk about that. Yeah. So what, if the patient was not a surgical candidate, what would we do to mitigate the risk of coronary occlusion to proceed with TAVR? Right, so some of you might be familiar with the basilica procedure, which is less intentional laceration of the aortic valve leaflet 
to make it less likely to go and obstruct the coronary artery. This was certainly a consideration here. We do have experience with that. Uh, but the problem was, we don't know if the leaflet was very long. Like even if we do a basilica procedure, is that going to be enough to mitigate the risk of coronary occlusion? Uh, remind you that you know the, the mortality if you get coronary occlusion, even in the best hands, is over 50%. So we're very, very careful with uh, when, when that risk shows up, right? Um, and then also the, the actual procedure, even though it has been streamlined, it's, it is associated with higher stroke risk and higher complication rate than a typical TAVR. So we did offer the patient a, an attempt for basilica and uh, TAVR at the same time with potential coronary uh, protection as well uh, versus SAVR. And eventually the patient agreed to undergo SAVR and they also have done well since. All right, I think we can move on to the next one in the, for the sake of time. Do you wanna take a quick question if there's any, any burning question in the chat box or I, I could move the slides while you're checking. I don't have any questions showing up on my side. Okay. Do you? Perfect. Sounds good. So uh, next case is a 77-year-old male with worsening fatigue and severe aortic stenosis. So he's tolerating his symptoms. We see that all the time, right? Symptoms don't show up the same fashion in everybody. Some patients have more than others. Uh, and he is a relatively healthy man. He's, uh, he jogs. He still works. He's active. He has his major organs are functioning well. There is no severe valve disease or severe coronary disease that can be, you know, problematic in, in treatment. Uh, surgical risk was low to intermediate, 3.9%. The valve anatomy was suitable for TAVR. He would have been a candidate for a 26 uh, balloon expandable valve or 29 self-expandable valve. But here is, here is a problem, right? Well, I'm showing you an angiogram of the distal abdominal aorta showing obstruction of both iliac artery, complete occlusion, making you know, transfemoral TAVR a, a, a relatively important challenge, right? So what would you do in this case? TAVR, TAVR, medical management and uncertainty. So the poll is back, 48% uh, said refer for SAVR, 38% said refer for TAVR, 5% medical management, and 10% uncertain. Great. Yeah, so here, th th this shows us, you know, the importance of the other team members in the heart team. The heart team is not just a cardiologist and a cardiac surgeon, right? We, can, we have access to other specialists who know more than us in, in other areas. So... This, this is a great example of that. So this patient actually underwent TAVR um, uh, where the, the, even though he had a relatively you know, chronic occlusion of the iliacs, but the vascular surgeons deemed that this is actually pretty amenable to, transca to, to, uh, to opening the artery with a stent. Uh, so, and it was actually a much smoother than what we have thought as cardiologists, right? So the plan that the the uh, the procedure went as the patient uh, had a you know balloon uh, PTCA of his of his iliac artery opened the artery, put the sheath in, did the TAVR, and put laid the stent out, uh, laid the stent in the iliac artery on the way out. The patient had severe aortic stenosis and he was less uh, becoming less active, so he didn't actually pay much attention to potential claudication symptoms. But then after we did the TAVR and opened the artery, he said, well, I feel a lot better. I'm moving now. He's moving more and his left leg now has claudication. So he came back for a second intervention on the left side afterward with the vascular surgery team. So, so even though SAVR would have been a safe bet here, uh, knowing that, you know, it's always, it's always the same question. This other problem that you have, is it addressable with a catheter approach and not? That's number one. Number two, is the catheter approach low risk or high risk versus the surgical approach? And we always try to select what would be the best here, right? So great question here. I'll move on to the next one. I think uh, our poll opened unexpectedly, so we'll close that. 
So the next case is a 74-year-old female with shortness of breath, severe bioprosthetic aortic stenosis. She's had two prior sternotomy. She's had an aortic valve, uh, a small aortic valve, 23 millimeter, uh, and she has a high gradient across that valve, and she's symptomatic from it. So she comes in for evaluation, and the CT scan shows this image, shows that she's had a, a large ascending aortic aneurysm, uh, relatively calcified aorta, but not porcelain aorta. Uh, and then uh, because she's had two prior surgeries and the dilated aorta, uh, she was deemed to be high risk for surgery. STS score was 11%. And then she did have, uh, you know, suitable valve anatomy per, uh, for a valve and valve, but there were two problems. We would have to put a smaller valve inside and the coronary height, even though it was suitable, it was borderline low. And some people here feel that if you put a self-expandable valve, you will get a better area. But the concern here is, as, as you guys all know, the self-expandable valve has a crown on the top and the crown can bud into this uh, dilated aorta and cause a dissection. So the option here would have been a, a balloon expandable valve um, that is 20 millimeter in size versus going for redo surgery. Uh, so really a challenging scenario that took a lot of uh, discussions with the, with, the, with the heart team and with the family. What would you do in this case? So surgery here would not just be aortic valve replacement, it would be root replacement plus replacing the aortic valve, right? It's a third redo, STS score is 11%. Taver here would be putting a 20 millimeter uh, balloon expandable valve and leaving the aneurysm alone. Medical management may not be a bad bet either here, but she is fairly symptomatic and she's 77. So let's see what people would have select here. So refer for Saver was 57%, refer for Taver 24, 5% uh, of people would pursue medical management and 14% uncertain. Um, what did you what pursue? What would you do, Sarah? I was um, gonna ask you, what would you do? I probably would go for surgery and address both of them. But I think if the patient, if the, it were, <clears throat> I would look at the aneurysm and see has it been stable over a period of time. If it was stable and patient preferred TAVR, I think that would be an option. Mm -hmm. What do you, what would you know, you be on that? Yeah. And, and, you know, a question just showed up also, uh, can you, you know, it's a great question because it addresses what we said earlier. Can this additional problem be addressed with a catheter approach, right? So the, the, the uh, Ruth is asking, uh, can we do endovascular graft to the ascending aorta and then do TAPR? Uh, and that's why exactly we pulled our uh, advanced uh, you know, uh, cardiovascular surgeons. We do have surgeons who do TAPR, but we have some surgeons also who do endografts uh, among in the TAPR group. So we, 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 we brought them to the picture and we had a multi-surgeon discussion. Uh, so we had a couple of surgeons and uh, two cardiologists going in here. Uh, we felt that uh, an endograft would be not feasible here. We're not there yet with that technology to address this, this particular anatomy. Uh, and then the, the surgical approach, despite its higher risk, would still be more preferable. The, the, the aneurysm was stable, as you, you asked that question. It was stable for a couple of years before. But uh, the, the worry about you know, the coronary occlusion, the small valve size, having a prosthesis mismatch, and having residual symptoms is what made the team decide to offer the patient the high-risk surgery. And this is another great thing here, right? So she was initially seen by a cardiac surgeon who does not do uh, aortic work, right? He doesn't do uh, vascular work. So we, we were not shying away from pulling another surgeon into the mix where you know, he, he asked for a second opinion. And uh, fortunately, we had that great discussion with the family. They felt confident with the surgeon who does both interventions and they went for the surgery. Perfect. I think we can move to the next one. Right. If people are getting tired, I'm sorry if, if this sounds like a marathon. I mean, the goal is not to go through too many cases. The goal is to really stick these five questions in mind, uh, where anytime you're seeing a patient, right, 
ask these five questions and ask your surgeon, you know, if you're an APP working in the clinic, well, why, why do we do this? Why don't we do that? Sometimes you will be surprised how many times Sarah has called us out on things uh, or pay, you know, drew, drew our attention into other aspects that we, we did not, we, we could have missed. So, so it's, you have a very important role in the heart team. And, uh, but sometimes categorizing things in, in a simple you know, five question format or some question format would be helpful in, in not missing anything. So the next case is an eight year old female with class three dyspnea occasional dizziness and severe aortic stenosis. And remember, dizziness is either a sign of very bad aortic stenosis, because it could be a presyncope kind of thing, or it could be a sign for some concomitant disease, right? As you see in this case, the patient was found to have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. These patients typically have uh, syncope, presyncope, or dizziness as part of their symptomatology. So keep that in mind as you have some other symptoms, some TAVR symptoms are typical like dyspnea, some other ones are not very typical. So use that as your hint to the concomitant pathology here. The patient was frail. She has CKD stage four and she, she, was, she was evaluated for a, a combined aortic valve replacement and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy surgery, uh, which is myectomy. And the surgical risk was felt to be approaching high risk here, but not quite yet, 7.8%. The, va the valve had a suitable anatomy for TAVR and the transfemoral axis was fine. So let me ask you now, you see this patient in clinic, in your particular clinic, would you do uh, SAVR and myectomy? Would you do TAVR and alcohol septal ablation? Would you do medical management or not sure? As you're answering that also, I would like to hear from you if you could put in the chat comment, uh, what would you do if, you're, if your center does not offer a HOCAM treatment, right? Not all centers have access to alcohol septal ablation or to surgical myectomy. So what would you do in that case too? So answers are in, refer for SAVR and septal myectomy would be 24%, refer for TAVR and alcohol septal ablation, 62%, and then 14% uncertain. Right, so, so that's higher uncertainty than usual, right? Uh, so that brings us to that. I think that that is an important consideration is what will you do if your center doesn't offer them? And I could tell you that the, the mean myectomy volume per centers in the US is one to two cases a year. That's most centers because it's not a common thing and uh, most centers don't do enough of it. So some people may or may not have experience with, uh, with that, that, uh, that kind of surgery. Same thing for septal ablation. The volume is a little bit higher but still it's condensed in certain, in certain centers. We're, we're fortunate to be one of the sites that we have, we do a lot of myectomy surgery. So we had the myectomy surgeon look at this. They offered the patient a high risk uh, to SAVR and myectomy. And we offered the patient uh, TAVR and um, they have the suitable anatomy for alcohol septal ablation. So we actually came to the patient with equal recommendation here. We said they're both comparable in our opinion and we'll let you decide. Uh, because of the frailty and the kidney disease, the patient was a little bit, you know, had a little bit of a preference towards the transcatheter approach. So this patient is actually scheduled for a septal ablation followed by TAVR soon. Dr. Alcooli, what would be the risk of just proceeding with the TAVR and not addressing the Holcomb for this patient? Yeah, great question. You know, there's something called suicide heart. Um, which is a weird, uh, uh, I guess, nomenclature, but that's that's the term that's used in the literature, uh, where sometimes you do TAVR, you miss that there is hokum in the mix, and then the patient does not respond. They go into incessant VT, and they sometimes they 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 die from that. That's because you know you're opening an obstruction, but you're leaving another one. The heart is is used to have a chronically elevated pressure and you take away that pressure by fixing the aortic stenosis. The heart becomes more hyperdynamic, right? And then that we know that hyperdynamicity is, is the enemy of hokum. So you're sort of worsening hokum, creating severe MR on the table, which is sometimes not recognized. And remember, we now do most of our procedure with thoracic echo. 
So depending on the windows, uh, you may actually miss that. And there have been papers showing that a couple percent of patients with severe AS some have, have hokum. Now, this is only relevant in the severe form of hokum like this case, right? That you could see from the image here that there is a uh, there is already a uh, systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve and it's it's a significant hokum. So yes, yeah, suicide ventricle is what we fear with the cases of hokum. If it's mild, then most of the time you're okay. You just have to pay attention to hydration and beta blocker at the time of the case. But if it's severe, we would strongly recommend that we address that too. Perfect, thank you. All right, a couple more cases here. So this one is also an 83-year-old male with class two dyspnea, chest pain, and severe aortic stenosis. So ask the same five question, right? Any concomitant cardiac condition, any major non-cardiac condition. So even though the patient has severe mitral calcification, uh, the, the major valves were not severely diseased besides the aortic stenosis. So we said no to concurrent cardiac decision, uh, conditions. Kidneys, liver, lungs working okay. So no major non-cardiac uh, problem. Surgical risk was intermediate. And we got stuck with the valve anatomy here. So take a look, pay attention to that CT. This, this bright spot that you see on the top of the screen is not calcium, it's just streaming from the contrast coming from the uh, SVC. But everything else that is bright, that is typically calcium. So take a look at the aortic valve as it comes. So this is tricuspid here. And we're moving to the left side of the heart. We're seeing the mitral valve and the aortic valve coming. You see the aortic valve has reduced opening, severe calcium, severe calcium in the annulus as well. I'll let that play one more time so you could, you could discern the calcifications. So there is a lot of calcium in the annulus. And now the next question then was, uh, if you could see that here, right? This, this spot here is the concern. So the, the concern here is if we do TAVR, are we going to have an annular injury because the balloon would push the valve out to the annulus um, or no, should be fine? Should we refrain from TAVR and send for SAVR? Or is this too high risk to do anything? We should just do medical management. Uh, so results are in. Refer for SAVR, 68%. Refer for TAVR, 16%. Medical management, 11%, and uncertain, 5%. So I think everybody who's answering should just, you know, skip the boards. You don't need the boards. You're doing greater than what the board would, would allow you to learn. Um, I'm just kidding. The, these are great questions, great answers. Uh, we, this is what exactly we did here. The risk of annular injury was high, in our opinion, and the surgical risk wasn't too high. Now, we don't want to be tunnel vision where everybody should get TAVR, right? TAVR is good as long as the anatomy is suitable. But if the anatomy is not suitable, then I would really caution, caution you about forgetting about these things and just going through this you know, uh, ride that everybody should get a TAVR. So what would you do here, Sarah? Would you agree that surgery was the right thing to do? Yeah, in a patient that was a moderate risk who is willing to take those, those risks, my question for you would be, would they be at an increased risk for paravalvular leak with TAVR? And if surgery wasn't an option, do you have a preference? Would you use a self-expanding or a balloon expanding uh, valve in these patients? Right. So this is a dilemma, right? We don't know if using a balloon expandable valve is higher risk than using a self-expandable valve. And that's uh, the reason is, Self-expandable is good in a sense that you don't have to balloon, right? So you could put the valve and it would open up gradually. And hopefully that would minimize the risk of the balloon pushing the calcium out. However, in our experience, we also have seen that when you try to do that, there is a significant leak uh, because the calcium is not as usually specul speculated calcium and not very you know, uh, smooth. Uh, and then you end up having to post dilate the self-expandable valve. And then we're really back to square one now. So you have the leak and then you have the, the risk of, of uh, annular injury. 
I don't think there is a right or wrong answer. Uh, Self-expandable can be done if it is done. Uh, then you just have to be careful with the, you know, with the landing so you minimize the risk of leak. If you do a balloon expandable valve, it it is it's probably a good option too, but you just have to be very careful with oversizing or over inflating the balloon. Uh, so I think in my in my practice, the risk is is comparable actually. I don't think one valve does better than the other one in this sense. And I think surgery certainly does a lot better, okay. which is what we did here. And one of the questions that came through, the chest pain that the patient was experiencing, do we consider that due to the aortic stenosis? I mean, I think the answer in that is we look at the coronaries of these patients ahead of time. Um, and kind of goes yeah. back to the question, when, when do you intervene on the coronary disease if they're symptomatic with angina? Right. So angina is not a typical symptom. It happens due to aortic stenosis. Um, Certainly, for the you know, not all angina is due to major major epicardial disease. So the patient can have endovascular dysfunction, which can also be made worse by aortic stenosis. So there was no no clear reason here because the epicardial coronaries were fine. Um, the patient did have significant improvement in the frequency uh, of his chest pain, but still had some chest pain at times. So so this is mostly that's that's another thing, right? When we have patients with symptoms, you want to find out if the aortic stenosis is complicit or involved in, in the symptomatology or a bystander, right? There was a great editorial a couple of years ago where, where people would, would feel that everybody should get a TAVR because they're, they're sick. Well, some patients end up dying with aortic stenosis, not from aortic stenosis, right? So we want to, if you're subjecting a patient to a even though it's low risk, but it's an involved procedure, CT scans, cath, you know, uh, uh, risk of complication, whatever, we would like to have some certainty that the, the, the symptoms are going to be at least uh, in a re reasonable chance of improvement. So I always tell the patient when, for example, another one would be a patient with severe lung disease, right? We get those frequently, like we don't know if they're gonna improve with TAVR or not, even if they have severe symptoms or severe aortic stenosis. So we tell them that, you know, this is the risk, the chance, there is a fair chance that you will improve your symptoms, but it's uncertain because of the contaminant disease. So. And I think that's really important. I think that's really important. Make sure that they understand that you know, their shortness of breath may not go away altogether with their other diseases and setting the expectations up front for the patients really is helpful. So. Because, you know, otherwise our nurse practitioners will keep getting calls from the patients afterward. You guys promised me that everything will, will go away. I'm going to run the marathon again, and I'm not doing that, right? So we have to have realistic, don't, don't over-promise, don't under-promise, just give realistic expectation from our experience. This is what we think will happen. And, uh, you know, we're, we're physicians. We use the tools we have. We, we have to predict things, but we're not always perfect. And I always ask the patients, what is their goal with, you know, undergoing TAVR or surgical aortic valve replacement? Are we addressing the concern or are they still going to have the concern once their valve is fixed? So I think, again, seeing what their expectations are. Absolutely. Great. So two more cases, uh, and then we'll see if you guys have any more questions. So this is a 76-year-old female with mild symptoms. So not a lot of symptoms. Loss of stamina is her main symptom. But the LV uh, left ventricle is dilated, and he has severe, aortic, very severe aortic regurgitation with uh, you know, reversal of flow in the, in the abdominal aorta on echo. So... She's really relatively healthy. She still hikes. She has no concomitant cardiac decision, uh, kind of cardiac conditions. She has no major uh, renal, liver, or lung disease. She did have prior chest radiation from Hodgkin lymphoma many, many years ago. Surgical risk was 2.9, but we know that is an underestimation given that the STS score does not account for prior radiation. And for people who criticize that, you just have to know how these scores are made. To be able to model a risk score, you have to have enough of the condition that you're including in the score. And the score just, there was not enough radiation patient to, to you know, come up with a reasonable, accurate prediction. Um, so, so surgical risk is, is low, but uh, it's likely more than that, right? And then this is the, just a snapshot of the echo showing you know, severe aortic regurgitation and the valve opens fine without any calcification. 
So the patient was actually referred by the valve doctor to have TAVR, um, fearing that the redo, uh, sorry, not a redo, but a, a, a open surgery with the prior chest radiation would be too risky here. So what would you do in this case? Would you offer TAVR, um, knowing the anatomy uh, and knowing the prior radiation, or would you only do SAVR? Or would you do medical management? That's a good question here for, you know, for the minimal symptoms that the patient is having. Yet the, the, the valve is very severely leaky and the LV is dilated. So on this one, we had refer for SAVR 67%, refer for TAVR 19%, medical management and 14%, and no uncertain. And in her, we chose medical management and to continue to follow her routinely um, and educated her on the symptoms of worsening AR. If the patient presented back to you in six months and was now symptomatic and declined surgery, would you offer her off-label TAVR for AR? And what would her risk be with that? A great question. So we did a combo of one and, and uh, three here, right? So we said, uh, no TAVR, we will medically manage you now because symptoms were mild, even though we have dilatation in the, in the, uh, in the ventricle, we, tra we traced the echo, the multiple prior echoes, and it was very mild change. Uh, and she's a very, you know, highly very smart patient who is very has a high high understanding of her disease. So she preferred not to do the intervention now. But when she comes back, we said surgery will be option number one. Taver is not out of the picture, but as you know, the risk of embolization is higher with the lack of calcifications that anchor the valve in the annulus, and the the procedure is considered off label. Is there any anatomy that makes it less high risk for AR? Anything that helps favor TAVR and AR? Yeah, so actually she has, she has a slightly favorable anatomy because the valve is not very large, right? So you have a chance of putting a self-expandable valve and oversized by a lot. And you, if you oversize adequately, then the chance of embolization is a little bit less. Um, the problem is most of those patients actually are not her. Most of those patients are patients who have bicuspid disease, dilated aorta, a very large annulus where they would need a very large valve. So your chance of oversizing is, is smaller. Um, so her anatomy is, was actually more favorable uh, despite the lack of calcium compared to most of the patients that we see referred for, uh, for TAVR for AI. And, uh, and you know, the, the, the issue also of off-label brings in important consideration here, which is um, what does that mean exactly? If you tell the patient off-label and they, they go home, they may celebrate, yeah, I got an off-label procedure, I'm very happy. Uh, off-label means that the, the intervention proposed is not, that the device that we used for the, we're using for this is not designed to do that, right? It's designed to treat a different disease. But off-label things happen fairly frequently. I mean, if you look at the national registries, uh, a lot of interventions are designed to treat one thing and then you see some indication creep and the, the devices start addressing other problems. The problem with that is that sometimes payer would object and would say this was not done in on-label fashion and therefore we will not reimburse the procedure. So we discuss all of that upfront with the patient that there is a financial risk. Uh, with this procedure. If there's no other option, then, then the, most patients will still elect to do it, but that has to be kept in mind. Perfect. We'll move to the next case. And then I think a couple of questions came through so we could address them after. So this is actually a relatively similar, uh, I guess that, that that's a little bit of a cheating on the slide because you could see a tavern up here. I missed that. But anyhow, so this is an 86-year-old male with class 2 dyspnea and severe aortic regurgitation. He didn't have a lot of concomitant cardiac disease. His EF was slightly reduced, but not a lot. His aorta was dilated, but uh, still within normal limit. I think was slightly enlarged, 4.4 centimeter. 
Um, he had some cognitive decline, even though he drove all, many miles to come to Mayo by himself. There was clearly some memory issues and some cognitive decline. He was frail, his SDS was close to high. And he, the, the, the question was, should we do Taver and Saver? And I guess since I already uh, displayed the answer here, we could skip the question and just have a discussion here about what, why did we select this? And part we could contrast reason, this with- Part of the reason we chose Taver for him was patient preference. He did live alone and had no family to help take care of him and was worried about long-term rehab ability. So um, again, his preference mostly there. So that's, that's exactly correct. So we, we treat the patient as a whole, right? So the social aspect are very important. Sometimes, especially we, we learned this, especially during COVID, right? Patients, the uh, rehab centers were very tight and uh, had very stringent criteria. And patients who undergo surgery, they really need good home support. And if there is nobody, this man lived literally alone. In, in, a, in a city that was many miles away, many hundred miles away from Mayo. So, so we, he, he strongly said, if you could do something without surgery, we prefer that. And then we did all the techniques that we can, we employed all the techniques that we can to minimize the risk of embolization. So we selected a self-expandable valve, which typically are deployed, are typically deployed without pacing, but we did rapid pacing and uh, slow deployment. We left the valve uh, two thirds of the way deployed for about uh, 10, 15 minutes to make sure it's not uh, moving. And that was successful. The patient did well and he went home in two days after that. Um, so despite the fact that, you know, the anatomy was not, was not great, the first patient had a better anatomy, but the other conditions here played a role where we decided to go with surgery, right? So I think that sums up the cases. Sarah, do you have any a couple of questions in the chat box? And then we could just summarize those conditions that we talked about that impact yeah, one, our decision to go for. One of the questions says, how do you choose what type of TAVR valve, meaning self-expanding versus um, balloon expandable in all cases? What do you take into consideration? Right, so certainly uh, we, we typically, you know, that's, that's sort of like an operator preference. Uh, in our practice, we use balloon expandable valve for the majority of patients. We use uh, self-expandable valve in patients who have very small annulus, sometimes for valve and valve, sometimes for calcific annuli. Um, and I think there is most of the clinical trials and the observational data that is out there have shown that they have comparable uh, performance so I think overall it's it's an operator preference. I do suggest that if you that you you gain experience in both valves, even if you are predominantly doing one of the two, uh, it will not be ideal if you only do the other kind maybe once a year or twice a year. So I think a reasonable strategy, site specific strategy for selection would be important here. Okay. And then um, one of the other questions was, when is aortic annular calcification too much to proceed with uh, TAVR safely? When do we get, when do we look at surgery instead? A great question. We, we use uh, the calcium score of the aortic valve and the annulus. Typically when it exceeds 4,000, we, we start pausing here. So the patient I showed you, we didn't do it. It was uh, 6,800, uh, the, the valve, aortic valve calcium score. Uh, and sometimes it's not only the score, it's actually the shape of the calcium. Sometimes patients have like a, a lower range in the 3,000, but they have a boulder of calcium, like something that you know that if you balloon this, you're gonna get in trouble. So it's not always the score, but we take the score into the, you know, the primary screening consideration. How about TAVR in bicuspid aortic valves? Where are we at with that? <laughs> yeah, so there's no randomized trial yet, but uh, data, observational data have shown that with the newest generation valves, um, the, the, the outcomes are almost identical. There is some data showing a slightly higher risk of stroke if you have bicuspid valve, but other data showing comparable results. So, in our practice, bicuspid valve is becoming less of a determinant of which route we go, unless there was a concomitant aortic disease, which we know is common, right, in these patients, if you have aortic dilatation, or if the age is too young, because some of those patients typically are in the younger spectrum of, uh, of AS patients. 
So maybe we should just summarize the last slide, Sarah. Is there yeah. any other question? No, that was it. So Saver versus Tavern, it goes back to the five questions that you focused on. Is there multivalvular heart disease? Um, can it be a percutaneous option? Is there any major non-cardiac condition that would prohibit them? What is their surgical risk? Do they have suitable valve anatomy? And then is the TF access possible? So again, questions we ask ourselves every day in clinic as we're seeing these patients. That's great. And one, one other thing I want to say here is this is an evolving field, right? So we don't have the answers to everything uh, and we don't have treatment for everything. But for example, your atrial fibrillation, most of the time it will get dismissed as, you know, we, we just treat that symptomatically. But sometimes we we have patients coming for aortic stenosis where the AFib actually is the primary problem. And we have patients who come and say, we had to ablation, I both ablation failed, my heart rate is not controlled, I have severe annular calcium, my mitral valve doesn't work well uh, when I go to rapid AFib. So even, even if the mitral valve is not severely stenosed or regurgitant. So if you if you collectively feel that aortic atrial fibrillation in a certain is in a specific patient is the primary problem, then we have to address that. Even in the lack, you know, you're not going to have data that fits every single patient. So we have to be a little bit innovative and think of the patient as a whole and give the best judgment as a whole team, right? So we've had patients where we sent patients for surgery because we felt that AFib in them is very important and they would do better if they have surgical ablation given that transcatheter ablation has failed before. So these, this is just to you know, keep this as a guide in your pocket, in your clinic. And I always ask myself, what are the five questions, right? And then the five questions can, can vary, but if you have, if they have them in the categories in your mind, then I think it will be easier for you to, to address things as they come. And again, anything uh, can be modified and, and advanced further in the future. And I suggest people who do this to, to even push for more data to be published and more studies to be you know, collaboratively done, uh, then, then we, we will have like in a few years, I am hoping that when the valve, when the valve practice evolves into the best TAVR valve, the best TAVR valve that we have, then the, the clinical decision also evolves into the best decision tree that any that is simple, that is nimble, available in every clinic and, uh, and then can lead to a productive discussion. So I think we're nearing the end of our time. Um, and we just wanted to say thank you for allowing this opportunity and joining in our webinar this evening. Um, if you have any further questions, we're gonna pro uh, provide our email address if you can advance the slides um, and you guys can email at any time and let us know. So Sarah, I see that you didn't put your Twitter account. You only put mine. <laughs> I just tweet your stuff. Thank you for that. <laughs> okay. Well, so. thank you everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. This is, I, I always enjoy, you know, ha having uh, discussions with our nurse practitioners in the clinic and our heart team. And uh, it is really, this is, this is what makes the TAVR clinic more enjoyable than just, you know, going through the motions and, you know, okay, we're going to just do TAVR. Those patients that have that that are bring more mentally stimulating scenarios, and we they they feel that we're trying to think hard, we're trying to do the best to come up with the best decision for them, and they always feel appreciated. Uh, so thank you all for joining us today, and looking forward to seeing you again in a in a future webinar. Thank you.